Yes. So welcome, Liz Ness. Uh, thank you for coming in. Thank and, you. Um, we will start out with the predictable questions about development issues, which uh, seems to highlight this race once again. Um, as the only incumbent running in this race um, with a track record, to a voting record, um, I wonder if you could address those in the community uh, who have categorized you as part of the more sympathetic to development in this community um, and respond to them with what you believe your, is an accurate depiction of your views mm -hmm. towards mm -hmm. commercial and residential development. So to begin with, I wouldn't say that I can either be categorized as establishment nor residentialist. I think I am in the middle somewhere. I think I'm reasonably balanced, pretty moderate. As to um, the comments about being sympathetic to developers, um, let's start backwards. You know, did I get development money when we just declared? Actually, I got no development money. Um, one, there's one mistaken one listed, but other than that, I was very careful not to take any development money. You're talking about four years ago? No, just right now. No, okay. Just the report that just came out, right? And secondly. Is there, are we more sympathetic, some of us on the council, toward development than others? Most of the development that has come through is part of zoning. And the only development we've had to make decisions on are those that have been appealed. And there have been two or three that have been appealed, usually on compatibility issues, some of which I have found were, I, I didn't find they were not compatible. As far as leaning toward developers, I say I'm reasonably for growth. I'm not totally anti-growth, even though I voted for the 500,000 square foot um, limit in the downtown that will expire next spring. Do you mean the 50,000 square foot? I'm sorry, limit? yes, the 50,000. <laughs> I just want to make yes, sure sorry. we're talking about the yes. same 50,000 square feet, yeah. right. 50 foot height limit, 50,000 square feet, right. right. So when you look back at the last four years, do you have any regrets about any of the votes you cast relating to, to commercial development? Would you, would you redo, ask for redos on any of those? Well, that's four years. I don't know that I would. Um, it's also, I'm not sure I recollect every one of the votes that I've taken, probably hundreds of votes over the last four years. Um, I think I have sometimes gone one way, sometimes another. I know people were very surprised about the Mercedes-Benz vote that took place in June, where I felt that, was, that building was too high. But as far, usually what we're asked about is, weren't we troubled about the design? And I like a mix. I like it being eclectic. Your building here is lots of glass. I don't mind the Burge Clark type any more than I admire the, the glass and steel, but I, I think both have a place in our community. But as far as my regrets, if I look back, I think my only regret, to be honest, was not about development. It was about not seeing what was happening in the Barron Park Maybell vote. And that one, that one still is, um, it, it still is difficult to look back on. I regret the lack of affordable housing, but I also regret that we didn't read a community correctly before it happened. And I think we ended up being very divided. And I think at this juncture, I think we finally are back on a better spot. I, I looked at my endorsements. I have both Pat and I have Tom Du Bois. So I've got different sides. Karen Holman has even indicated she would vote for me. So I, I think we're at, at a different place now. I don't feel this huge divide that I felt in 2014. And I think that's good for the community. And I think it's good for all of us. I think we're trying to work together. I think we're trying to make good things happen in the community. So a follow-up on the development cap. Um, you along with your colleagues, supported that in its, final, yeah, it was its final form. There was <clears throat> difference of opinion yes. uh, prior to that. Yes, a lot of difference of opinion. Right. Um, are you viewing that as uh, 
completely an interim measure, or are you thinking in terms of some form of development cap and a metered system of some sort going forward? I think a metered system is good going forward. But, but before we do that, let's go back to 1986, when they had essentially a very brief moratorium and then established that the downtown was made up of 3.5 million uh, square feet and said, we will put a 10% cap on that figure. We haven't reached the 10% cap yet, which would be three, 350,000 square feet. We haven't reached it. In 2014, we essentially put the first cap on. And as of last year, as of June, which is, we, we count June to June, as of, that, as of that time, we hadn't reached 50,000 square feet. As of now, we have no applications at all for commercial and residential, for commercial and R&D. We have two for very small condo developments that I think is, is under 15 to 20 units not at total. So I think we're in a really different spot, but I'm, I don't believe that long term we want to stop all growth, but metering it, keeping track of it, being more aware of it, being very conscious of the community and where they are on it is what I think is the most important. So the 50,000 cap only affects Cal the El Camino, it, California Avenue, downtown right, area. Do you, right. Do you propose expanding it citywide? No, when and, it and that's where I differ from some of the, the, of the and, candidates and, and running. And why not? I think Stanford Research Park has really reached out in order to control their, their traffic a lot. And unless they get to the point where they show that they cannot meter it and monitor it, I am hesitant to go in and, and um, stop development there. A great deal of their development is infill. A lot of what has happened lately is infill. And I, I don't see us needing to control that at this point yet. Perhaps it will happen, but I also don't think I can sit here now and predict everything that's going to happen over the next year, two, three, four years. I, I hope we can be nimble, I hope we can be flexible, and I hope we can respond to the public. So why wouldn't you want to meter that type of development as opposed to elsewhere? I think, in the I think we are metering that type of development because they have a TDM of their own. It's, it's structured somewhat differently, but they have their own TDM, their own measurements. And um, while I haven't met with them, both the mayor and vice mayor have met with them and feel comfortable with the system that they have in place. But there are no requirements relating to we know, haven't, that new traffic. We haven't put any like new that. requirements on them, but they've put requirements on themselves. Like and I don't, I don't remember all of their figures, but they had agreed to a 10 or 20 percent reduction and proof of that. So that one I haven't been as closely involved with as I have the one, the, T, the TDM, TDM or the essentially our association downtown. So, as you know, the university itself has a, a very strict requirement that's been imposed upon them by the county um, right. of no net increase in traffic right. as right. a result of new development. Mm -hmm. That's been very successful. Very. I think everybody has agreed. So, why wouldn't you look to take the, the learnings from that and apply it to the research park where there is a single landowner that is therefore makes it quite different from other parts of the city. I you know I don't think we've addressed it that clearly. I know a lot about the control on campus because that was something I oversaw at the county. Right. Um, I'm not sure someone has really brought that up that clearly to us. I think it could be done. I think it's a it's a great idea, but I don't think that we had talked about doing that as measurement oriented, as you've suggested, that would be a good idea. But, but I don't agree with um, limiting their growth from our end, and I think your idea of limiting from their end and fines or penalties of some kind, which is what Stanford has within the, the main campus, would actually be good. It seems like um, the buzzword right now that people are really concerned about is jobs, housing, and uh -huh. imbalance being so out of whack. Do you have any regrets over the last four years of not pushing for more housing to be built in um, Palo Alto? I have regrets about us not doing more affordable housing in Palo Alto. 
I, I don't have regrets about any everyday type of housing, which would be residential. No, but I really have regrets about the affordable housing. And I have high hopes that uh, the Palo Alto Housing, which used to be Housing Corporation, has something in the, has two things in the pipeline. One at the end of California Avenue, which would join the ones that they put up uh, BMRs in the 70s. I think there are 43 units, and there's a discussion of doubling that number with the piece of land that they have close to the tracks. There's another piece that they have that's closer to downtown, closer to University Ave, and they're going to bring the first one to us at the end of October. The second one will come within the next few months, and I'd like to see a whole lot more done on affordable housing. We haven't really done anything since 08, 09 in there, except for, for 801 Elma, which was done by, by Eden Housing. Well, where's the property you're referring to at the base of California Avenue? Um, at, the, at the very end, beyond the now defunct fountain, off on the left. Hmm. I can't. Across I can't. from Palo Alto Central. Yeah, yeah but there's, uh -huh. there's the current Palo Alto housing right. development. Right. And there's sufficient land be, behind that to use. Uh, they showed me the map the other day, so I'm going to presume that it's sufficient right. Right. to do another, another um, almost equal number of units. Hmm. And they'll, they'll bring that to us by the end of the, I think by the end of this month. Mm -hmm. So back to affordable housing, um, I wish we had more opportunities to do that. And I think another place that we could look at that also, and, and this is probably more controversial, but at the corner of Page Mill and El Camino where the micro units were suggested and where it's PF zoning. So that zoning will be controlled by the council, no, no question. But could that be affordable housing? Could it be senior housing? Could it be a special kind of housing? Could it be something other than just everyday housing? And I think perhaps it could be. So do you not see high density housing as addressing the affordable housing problem? Do you see those as two separate options for the city? It depends on what the underlying subsidization is of the land. If the land um, is is purchased by the affordable housing entity, whether it's Eden or Palo Alto, whomever it may be, then it becomes affordable. But when it's affordable, we usually indicate that that's going to be sold within a certain income range, and which is what Palo, housing, Palo Alto housing goes by. And I think to be affordable, you also have to qualify for affordable. Otherwise, it's, it's, it just becomes market rate housing. Does that answer it clearly? Yeah, so yeah. my take is that you probably don't favor the current proposal that's out there for 2755 El Camino. The I think it's interesting. I think it should have a lot more discussion, but um, not the way it currently is. I don't, think, I don't think we have the appetite for going absolutely carless, and we're not feeling totally comfortable that a TDM could be enforced to the point where we can you know, have fines as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm, at this point, I'm watching it and, and it'll come back to us again. So with lots more information. Also, we are going to look for precedence because I think that's the most important thing we do. Look, look for someplace else where it's happened successfully. See how they did it. See what, you know, what part of the population it really serviced and was used by. So you correctly point out that the land cost is the driver here and the mm -hmm. cost of, of housing. Um, the city has from time to time talked about placing housing on its own property, on parking lots. Mm -hmm. um, in particular, there's going to be a garage built on one of the California Avenue parking lots mm -hmm. next to the public safety building. Why is the city not looking at more innovative uses of those parking lots so that when they are redeveloped it's going to be you know it's you get one shot at, at building right. on a parking lot mm -hmm. where are we not looking at putting housing uh, on for example that California <laughs> Avenue lot honest to God I, I, I would hate to say it's this simple but I think it is I don't think we thought about it I'm, I've included it in one of my brochures because I think it's a really good idea so we began looking around to find places where they'd actually done that. We found some places. We also found 
two locations for teacher housing. One is in Santa Clara, and the other one is in San Mateo County. And they're both quite successful. Um, I, I honestly don't know why we haven't looked at it, but as I said, I've, I've proposed it for the future. I think it just takes a, a very different look at a parking lot to think of having housing over the parking lot. So I haven't seen it done yet, but we're, we're looking for examples of it. But a good idea. And, and so it's really free space if you think about it. If it's our parking lot, it's, it's free. Also, Coverly has a huge parking lot. And we haven't even talked about Coverly yet, but that's, that's another possibility, mm -hmm. what, especially if you teach your housing. Under what conditions uh, would you be willing to consider going above the 50-foot height limit for um, affordable housing? Well, Mountain View has actually just done it. So, and they did it uh, very, very willingly. They did it unanimously. They even asked that they go higher. But that's a that's not an all affordable project. That's a no. BMR. That's a mixed. It's yeah. it's a mixed. I'm talking about. I'm You're talking about with just this concept of building on a city parking lot where perhaps that's a mm -hmm, place mm -hmm. where you can go up beyond the 50 foot right, limit right. and have very few negative consequences of that. I would be willing to look at it if it's especially close to transportation. If, if I can find a nexus between transportation and the housing, and therefore people would get out of their cars, and, and then the height limit would make more sense because you get far more use out of the building. So I think when we try this, we might first say, let's look at five stories instead of saying an absolute height limit, and then maybe go up to six stories. I think it's very much about the community. The community has been really determined at, 50, at a 50-foot limit since 1971 or two. Mm -hmm. So I'd be willing to try it, but um, I would hope as a council we'd be willing to look at it together and just, just in the way that Mountain View did. Yeah. Well, for a public project, you could just put it on the ballot and ask people to vote on whether they want it or not. We could. Yeah. We could. Yeah. We referended Maybell. We could certainly referend that. Yeah. Um, in terms of zoning, uh, the proposal for the VTA lot uh, would far exceed any zoning um, density right, right now. Right. Um, would you be in favor of any kind of zoning that exceeds what currently exists for not for that lot specifically, but just to enable projects around town, specific sites maybe that would have higher density of housing? Um, a possibility. I don't think we've really, you know, either flushed it or flushed it out yet. I think we really need to have much more of a discussion. We have been, as a council the last two years, we've approached a number of things somewhat tentatively, and I think we are moving more toward having frank discussions about what we could do in the future. So yes, long term, I'm not sure right at the moment I'd want to do that until we really have had more conversations in the community. But long term, you know, the never say never, because that, that could be a possibility. But right now, the, the issues of traffic and parking have, have been so, um, so prevalent in this. Uh, and as I go door to door, just to stop there for a minute, as I go door to door, there are People talk about the traffic, they talk about the cost of housing, almost always, and they talk about the airplane noise. Those, those three things seem to be, if I knock on your door, first of all, you're going to tell me there's no problem, and then you'll think for a minute, and as I start down the walk, you're going to say, just a minute, there is a problem. So, so those are the things that, that you know, give me pause. Um, I don't know how we're going to deal with our traffic more successfully, but I think that's one of the things we really need to keep looking at, that and parking. Yeah, a related question um, to that involves the VTA and its um, projections of maybe cutting service mm -hmm. to Palo Alto. Some people have suggested that maybe VTA should just step out of Palo Alto and we can just take the money and do it, you know, <laughs> with it what we want. What do you think is a realistic expectation 
um, in this coming couple of years uh, as far as improving uh, transit in Palo Alto, but also where does the, the VTA so let's talk about the VTA for a minute because they, they are countywide, as you know. Um, they tend to be dominated by San Jose. I served on their board. They have six votes. Makes it, makes it difficult. The only way I've discovered with VTA is to have relationships with the people who are on VTA and indicate that that really, it really makes a difference to us to have the roots they're, they're considering um, eliminating. We've gone, we went through this twice before during the 12 years that I was at the county and, and saved them, but it's difficult. As far as taking the money from BTA, they would tell you that that's not a possibility. We, we tried that actually with a shuttle that we started here in Palo Alto. We spent, I think, three years trying to get the money from BTA. I, I would advocate for something else that I think will bring money into the city, and perhaps we can use some of that toward our shuttle. I'm a proponent of Measure B. I worked on the group with the mayor and the vice mayor and um, uh, the person who heads up the group that's, that was pushing for it. And that will actually bring a certain amount of money to Palo Alto if we really stay vigilant and really stay, that, that money really was promised to us, there's no question. Harder to get it from VTA, but I think we really can bring the money back from Measure B because it's, it's, in the, it's in the language. It's in what's on the ballot. And I asked also to have language in there that would talk about money for proposals, because in order to get some of this money for shovel-ready projects, we have to be able to have studied it first. So I said, please include language that says we can study our, for our proposal first before we go for the shovel-ready ready money. That's often what keeps us from, from getting a project, is we haven't studied it sufficiently because it's expensive to study and put a proposal forward. You identified the downtown residential parking program in your survey response to yes. the Pelton Neighborhood Association uh -huh. as one of your big initiatives during the last four years. Um, I wonder where you feel that program has succeeded and where it's fallen short mm -hmm. and what lessons will be will you bring to the applications that are before you now for Southgate and Evergreen Park so the downtown RPP was was had been tried just before I was elected tried downtown and they felt that it had failed and so when we started it we began talking with the stakeholders, and I think I met with the stakeholders at least a dozen times before we put the first program into place. I think it's had a lot of fits and starts. Going into zones has been helpful, but we need to get more precise in what the percentage can be in the zones, how many cars can be in the zones. And I talked with somebody from Evergreen Park the other night and she was very concerned because she thought that they would have just 10% of their parking spots for them and 90% for the workers. And as you know, it's, it's the other way around. So the part of Palo Alto that's been the most willing to take the greatest number of cars has been North Palo Alto. So those are the zones one and two as you look at them and goes, goes into three. They've, they've agreed as stakeholders that, that they will take they will take 20, 20 15 to 20% of the workers can penetrate that particular area. I don't think it's a perfect solution, but I talked to one of the leaders the other day and I said, do you think there's something we could have done better? And he begrudgingly said, well, I don't know what it would have been. So I think it's not a good long-term solution. I wish we had satellite parking. I wish we had more shuttles that we could have for satellite parking. I think it's where we should, we, we should head in that direction long-term. And accidentally, Edgewood Plaza right now, the shopping center, is serving as a de facto parking lot. And the Marguerite and I think the shuttle are both going out there. So uh, that's not desirable. But it shows, I think, that you could have something that's satellite 
and, and it actually would be parked. So I feel, so back to your question, I feel that we had some success with the RPP. I think not uh, changing the rules for the zones 9 and 10 was actually a good idea. Although the first time we made the decision on that, it was quarter of one at night. And um, I actually asked the head of Crescent Park, is this something you could live with? And they said yes at that point. You've heard me talk about making decisions at quarter of one, or even 11.30 or quarter of 12. I just think you don't make good decisions then. We start at five. We have a heavy agenda. We have closed sessions. I don't think we and the staff going till after midnight makes just long-term sense. So do you feel the boundaries are So I jumped up. I'm sorry, I, I jumped around. Are, do you feel the yeah. boundaries of the downtown program are going to need to be further expanded, or do you feel like you've reached that point where people are beyond their willingness to walk? I, I, I think, I, well, I, it turns out we were very wrong about the willingness to walk. Right. But I, I'm not, we've included now, you know, we've gone pretty far out. We're out a mile. Um, some people will walk and bike and, um, and skateboard, but I, I think we're, we're getting to the point where people are not going to do that any longer. And have you been persuaded that the idea of gradually ramping down the number of permits available yes. is yes, the right I have way been. to go? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. okay. I think we can do that. It's over a long period of time. And I really think we, we can't just say, look, this is going to work forever because you're about to feel it in Evergreen, and they're about to feel it in Southgate. And Southgate has an even more difficult problem because it's primarily Palo Alto, it's the high school. And I would think that could be solved by the high school solving it from that end, and uh, instead of allowing it to spill into a neighborhood. And if you haven't driven that, you almost cannot get that on the, down the streets. It's nearly impossible. So. Applying all this to Evergreen Park in the California Avenue right, district, right. you're expecting to take a similar approach to what you've taken downtown, like it sounds like, as opposed to anything approaching the College Terrace approach. That would be what, that would be the way I would move on it, yes. Right. Right. To have a shared use yes, of the neighborhood yes. parking. Only because it's practical. You know, we built up California Avenue, it's doing really well. There is, there's no way for restaurants and other, where, where low wage earners are, they really do have to park somewhere. And yeah, we, unless you build another we have garage. An, yeah, which, and we're not, we, we will do that, but we're not there yet. Right. So with all the housing pressures and the commute horror stories that we're hearing these days, mm -hmm. um, a lot of people are concerned that there's been no substantial effort made to collaborate regionally uh, among the cities. And they're right. Um, and, You're I, right. <laughs> and I wanted to ask you both why is that, and then also what do you think you could do in your next term to foster new kinds of collaboration? Uh -huh. Yeah. So, as the incumbent, and I'm the only one right now that really has any regional connections, I'm, I'm sorry I didn't think to do something more regionally with traffic before. Because we do a good regional job with, with AIR, I serve on the AIR board. We do a good regional job with paying attention to what the state is doing with laws. We all work together as the Peninsula Division of the League. Um, we do a pretty good job with, believe it or not, health care insurance for kids in this community who need it. And somehow we forgot to deal with the, with the regional issue of traffic. So I think putting together a group that would include going outside of county boundaries, which is completely different. So going into Menlo Park, um, going with, with Mountain View, and also, also looking out toward Facebook and toward Google, and pulling a group together to say, you know, that traffic that's coming through Palo Alto isn't just Palo Altans riding around and around, or taking kids to school or whatever they may be doing. It's, it's, this is through traffic. And most cities figure that 80% of the traffic in their city is passing through. Isn't that kind of collaboration um, on the staff to do? But it usually starts with the elected 
officials putting pressure on the staff to do it because I don't think it's been done before. I don't know that other than years ago, and you might remember this, there was the Golden Triangle. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. Where there was an attempt for groups to come together and resolve the issue. This was more to the south, more, more in that North San Jose area, where they wanted to collaborate throughout the county. And I, that, I don't know if that fell apart or frayed at the but edges. The councils or, used to hold joint meetings with the Menlo Park City Council and the Municipal Haven't done City it for Council, a long time. And you get no sense that any of that's taking place, either behind the scenes or obviously well, not. Well, I, I know where it's taking place. It takes place on my, because on, I'm part of the Peninsula Division, the one that I'm president of for the League of California Cities. We do all come together. But it's usually around state issues rather than surprisingly local issues. And as I said, I'm a little nonplussed. I haven't thought of using that group for the very same reason. That would be a great, because so I to interact. Your, to your knowledge, there's been no <clears throat> staff to staff uh, discussions with Mountain View about all their development on San Antonio Road? I don't believe so. I don't have. I, I can't say an absolute no answer, but I don't think so. Okay. I, w I want to ask you about uh, the Airbnb phenomena, and oh. the council has elected to not step into that. Um, have, have your views evolved at all <laughs> on that? And if so, what, where are you in, on that well, issue now? My views two years ago were, with, were that we should have far more control over Airbnb. We brought it to the council. The council didn't agree with me. Um, and a couple of others who brought it for, it was a council memo at that time. I was really concerned about it. We had just been at a, um, at a conference in Texas, and we heard then that it was a problem. And while I was sitting there, I pulled up 400 Airbnb locations two years ago, and, and I was really alarmed about it. The other day, when we were discussing this, somebody looked at their phone and said, tonight in Palo Alto, it was a Saturday night, there are 1,259 Airbnb sites that are available. So it, it's not only that we're hearing the numbers, we're hearing problems with parking, we're hearing problems with tech companies virtually starting in, in an Airbnb run. And you know, is it bad to share your house? No. Um, do some people rent rooms? Fine, yes. I, it's, but as a long-term business, you're really running a little mini hotel in, in your neighborhood. And I think the neighbors have a right to say, we, we, there's, there's one area where the neighbors are having trouble parking because they're pretty sure someone is running a business in, in the house. So, so we're bringing it back again. Two of us have already started a memo saying we need to look at this. Even though we do collect some money from Airbnb, I think it's primarily when we push on Airbnb that we actually get any of the money, any of the taxes. D does that answer the question? Yeah, do you have any specific regulatory thoughts in mind in terms of how you would approach well, this? Uh, if, if, minimum if, number of days? Uh, well, I, I think it should be more by what is the impact going to be and we haven't looked at what other cities have done yet. As somebody said, San Francisco has a good um, ordinance in place. Well, permitting would obviously be a place to start. Right, right. But I, I think we need to look at how another city has handled it, because many cities have. Um, I've even it's heard the Palo Alto way. Well, <laughs> we don't have to do everything the Palo Alto way, <laughs> or the Palo Alto process, even. So the city has started to look at uh, relaxing rules around granny units to encourage uh, mm -hmm. their construction. Um, my understanding is that th there's not a lot of units that would probably be built. Yeah. Um, so that really qualify, right? Yeah. That, so as, as a kind of a, a, a mechanism to affect housing and housing affordability, I'm not sure it's really a, a starter. Um, but I wanted to ask you um, about some of the concerns that people express that they could turn into short-term rentals, for example, mm -hmm. and what kind of mechanisms could you see uh, putting in place in an ordinance to really enforce some of the, um, you know, the, the quality of life issues that could come from mm -hmm. uh, 
Well, you remember that Brown just just signed the state bill, 1056. I've forgotten which, which the number was, but that that says you have to relax the rules around parking. That's that's a new state law. It probably will be challenged, but that is the new state law. We have very clear real rules right now around putting a, an accessory dwelling unit in your backyard because you need a certain size lot, you need a certain configuration. It's it's very clear in the zoning. As far as would it become something that people are renting out? So I've been doing a lot of walking. Lots of people are renting out units. We're surprised at how many are renting out units and we don't know about it. So as I recall, when this has come up before, what we have is a, if the neighbor complains, we will take action. But if the neighbor doesn't complain, then the situation if that's a if then the ability to use your extra unit continues, so um, you know I'm not being a whistleblower in any way. I'm simply saying I've seen lots of areas where something is being rented out, and some of the areas it it makes sense. Maybe you have a student living at your house. You know maybe you have um, maybe you made part of your house into an apartment for your grandmother or something like that. that. That really has happened in town. So are those ADUs? I guess they're ADUs of a type. But um, I think most people think of an ADU as something that you're going to build. It probably will not be visible. It will be behind your house. And frequently, it's going to be for a, for a family member. I think the issue of um, enforcement, code enforcement in general, kind of keeps cropping up in it does. various yeah, topics it does. we discuss, whether it's Airbnb uh -huh. or this or uh, leaf blowers. Do you think that there is a there is a problem in the city with a lack of enforcement of the rules that are already on the books? Um, and if so, what do you think about that? I certainly have heard about it in the campaign. Um, I can think of some really egregious areas in town, especially buildings that they've started and not finished. I, I think we could probably find any number of code violations, and we probably could use another code violation officer with, without question. I think it's difficult, though, because in order to enforce it, you really have to impose some kind of fine. And we've been hesitant to do that, which, which is interesting. But we're discussing fines tonight. You probably know that. First time we've discussed a very substantial fine for a developer, which may change the outcome and, and may not. But um, I think there are times when we really have to enforce not only our code, but enforce the um, kinds of development we have done. One of, the, one of the things we've totally eliminated, which doesn't go quite to your question, but we no longer have PCs. So if you don't have a PC, you don't have to enforce the PC. Um, made it a lot easier. It's probably eliminated some of the more interesting projects that might have been suggested. But, but we essentially have, have tabled the PC. And I think it's pretty much permanent at this point. It's been a couple of years now, or maybe even three. If you're reelected, you're going to likely serve on a city council that will hire the next city manager. And I Bill has already told us he's leaving in 2018. He, in writing, He's, well, he was evaluated recently, so I'm not, I'm not opening a can of or Pandora's right. box. Well, it just confirms yes. what my yes. assumption was. Yeah, he had said well, ten years. Yeah. So, in looking for a replacement for him, how will the person look any different than Jim Keane, in your in your opinion? What is, do do we are we looking for a different leader the next time around or uh, a club. Yeah. So I so it's that that really is a good question. I think I think Jim has such incredibly good qualities. He is a big thinker. He's a visionary of sorts. He's um, very visible in the rest of the of the country. He's in demand all the time. I think we're probably going to look for somebody who's more of a uh, an operations person, you know, there's the operations at one end, there's the vision at the other end. And Jim does the best, I think, when he's had some strong operations people that work along with him, 
which he did for a year. And, you know, that just, uh, Suzanne just left it. At, I'd used her last name, but I've, I've forgotten it, I'm sorry. Mason. In June. Thanks. And so I think we need an operations person. Not that we don't need to have vision, but I think the council is going to have to provide the vision, and I think we're going to we're going to look for somebody. I'm guessing that will be more operations oriented. Could be wrong, but I I think that's a good possibility. It's a very practical council right at the moment. Well, it's going to be very. It's going to be a whole new council come November, right? It's going to be. And then it'll it certainly shrink is. In two more years. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, two more years. Actually, hires him, his replacement. Um, it's going to be a different, different council. Well, this this next council will hire his replacement. Right. And then you know, at the end of 2018, we go down to seven council members. Right. So, new city manager, new. Um, Make up on the council. Gosh, it's going to be <laughs> exciting time. Yeah, it will be. I, I think it will be exciting. It will be totally different. Well, Liznus, thank you very much for Thanks. coming in and thank you. sharing your thoughts with us.